Good evening, good evening. We'll get started in just a moment. I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar, which is being hosted by Fort Health in partnership with the Child Mind Institute. My name is Matt Beal. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I am the chief of child psychiatry at Georgetown University Medical Center in Washington, DC. I'm also the Chief Medical Officer at Fort Health, and I'm really pleased to welcome everyone and and personally glad to have a chance to to, to hold this discussion with some wonderful colleagues and, and hope that it's of help to everyone who's joined us tonight. The purpose of this gathering is to share information and guidance with parents and other adults in children's lives about how to support young people, specifically in the context of recent events in Israel and Gaza. Barbaric acts of terrorism occurred just over two weeks ago in Israel. A war in Gaza ensued with untold suffering of civilians there as well. Anyone who has followed events closely has been deeply affected by the brutality of the terror attacks and by the tragedy of civilians endangered and killed beginning on that day and continuing now, including too many children and families to comprehend. We've come together tonight to share the advice of experts on trauma and child and adolescent mental health about how we can mitigate the traumatic effects of these events upon our children, as well as upon ourselves. Before we get started, I just want to clearly establish several parameters at the outset. We will not be holding a political discussion tonight about the events happening in Israel and Gaza. We'll be focusing specifically and steadfastly upon how to support our children in the current context. We welcome questions and comments in the Q&A function of Zoom, but we will only field questions that adhere to these parameters. We ask for your cooperation as we do our very best to offer helpful information in an extremely stressful time. I'm really honored to be joined by three expert panelists tonight. Dr. Sharon Hoover is a clinical psychologist. She's co-director of the National Center for School Mental Health at the University of Maryland. She's an international expert in school-based mental health care and in supporting children and adolescents exposed to trauma. Dr. Mary Bar Halpern is a clinical psychologist. She's faculty member at Harvard University and director of the Intensive Outpatient Program at the Boston Child Study Center. She's also the author of Becoming a Superhero, a book for children who've experienced trauma. She is an internationally recognized expert in supporting children exposed to war. And finally, Dr. Harold Koplowitz has been a national leader in child and adolescent mental health care for decades. He's a child and adolescent psychiatrist as well, and he's president and founder of the Child Mind Institute. So Sharon, Mary, Harold, thank you so much for, for joining us. I hope it's okay if I just go to first names henceforth um, to, to keep things flowing. Um, and thanks so much for your expertise. Um, Sharon, I'll start with you. I'm gonna pose questions to each of you. Uh, please feel free to jump in and, and comment on other people's, uh, your, your co-panelists uh, comments or, or statements so that we can have a, a discussion as well. But I've got a number of questions I'm hoping that we can cover. Sharon, can you start by just sharing with us some thoughts about the potential emotional effects of these recent events on children who were not directly impacted, not living in Israel or Gaza, but still certainly affected by what's going on? Sure. Thanks, Matt. And thanks to you and your colleagues for creating this space to speak about this. Um, yeah, so to your question, we know that children, even those not directly impacted, may be experiencing a range of distressing feelings and emotions related to to the recent events. These can include fear, uncertainty, anxiety, sadness, and even grief. Um, we know that even for children not directly impacted, so for those living outside of the region or those without family and friends in direct danger, even some of our younger children who may not even be directly aware of what's happening, they may still experience distress. So they may sense fear or distress from parents or caregivers. Um, they may be exposed via media, social media. Um, and even those indirect exposures can cause unrest and disruptions in functioning. And that presents in all different Different ways, right? We know it can look like somatic complaints. So our kids may be reporting stomach aches or headaches or just more fatigue or tiredness. They may be having disruptions to their sleep or to their eating or to their schoolwork. 
and we know that that may be the case for a lot of young children not directly impacted. And then there are groups who may not be directly impacted, but may be more vulnerable, right? So we think of our children who do have loved ones in the region, and we know that those families may need to take the time to discuss children's concerns about their own safety, about their family safety. We know that a lot of families, given the nature of the current war, have legitimate fears about hate and hate crimes. And so they have concerns for their family safety and children in that context may have additional emotions and feelings. And then there are other, other you know, families who may have reminders of past trauma or loss that are really kind of triggered from what's happening right now. And the other group that's also quite vulnerable in this time are military connected youth. So they may be experiencing increased worry for loved ones who may de be deployed in the region or who they may worry may be you know, stationed there or be deployed in the future. So all sorts of reasons for children who may not be directly impacted to actually be experiencing distress right now. That's a great overview, Sharon. Thanks for, for getting us started and, and many things you mentioned, I think we'll come back to. Harold, just picking up from where Sharon left off, Sharon, from where Sharon left off, how, how can parents initiate or look for opportunities of a conversation with their children about what's happening uh, in the Middle East right now? Well, I think you have to remember there's a difference developmentally in what kids understand and what they're exposed to. So for instance, for kids 10 and under, I would shield them as much as possible from the news of the violence and the traumatic events uh, as much as possible. Now, I, I think that the media has actually been more responsible this time around than in the past, where they're not sharing videos that they've gotten from the terrorist group. They have kind of limited uh, the images that they showed us in the very beginning because they were so distressing. But nevertheless, parents have to take an active role to protect their kids from this. But I think it for slightly older elementary school kids and certainly for your teenagers, you have to start with an open ended conversation. Um, have, have you heard um, from anyone about what's going on in the world? Uh, there's a lot going on in the news right now. Uh, we want to know what you feel about it or what you know about it. Uh, you know, then be more specific, you know, and if your kid hasn't heard anything, then you should start with very small and see if they ask for more explanations and more information. So, for example, there was a terrorist attack uh, and there's a war going on and a lot of people were hurt. You're safe. Uh, but I want to know if you what you know, and you can always come to me, most important, to discuss anything if you're confused. And do you have any questions? I wouldn't force the conversation. If your child says, no, I know about it. I don't want to talk about it. Then wait, you know, don't push it. S start small and make sure that this is an ongoing dialogue. Um, I feel it's really important to remind them again and again that they're safe. We have to remember always that kids are very egocentric. They hear about another family getting divorced. They might be a little compassionate and see that their, their friend is upset, but then they're worried if you're going to get divorced. And so if these kind of barbaric events can happen somewhere, they don't care that it was thousands of miles away. They, they just need to be reminded that they're safe. And, and then let them guide the conversation and the questions and go into the conversation as informed as you can be, but prepare and, and prepare to answer their questions in a developmentally appropriate way. Uh, you don't need to know all the answers right away. And if you don't have an answer, it is always good to say, I, I need to find out more about that. I, I can understand that that's upsetting or that's a really good question, but let's Let's come back to it when I get more information. You can even ask an older child to do some of the research on their own uh, and come back and talk about it at a set date or a set time. But just remember to follow through. You want them to to understand that you're interested and that you're not turfing this for, you know, kicking the can down the road because it's an uncomfortable, difficult conversation. And I think the more direct you can be with them, asking things like, what do you think about what's going on in the Middle East? How are you feeling? What are your friends saying? Are all good open-ended questions that you have to accept whatever they say. So if they say, no one's talking about it, then that's all right. But you know, you can always talk to me about it. Otherwise, the most important thing in answering kids' questions is to be extra mindful of your own feelings. Anxiety is very contagious. Um, 
Our kids are really in, tuned into our moods and sensitive to messages adults intentionally or unintentionally send about their safety. And so you have to be prepared for this. Uh, I personally, uh, I'm the child of two Holocaust survivors. This is a very difficult conversation for me to have. And so when having it with colleagues, I will warn them ahead of time about how emotional I can get about this attack, that you know, a terrorist attack is different than war. It comes out of nowhere, it's unexpected. And the fact that innocent um, children and innocent civilians were attacked can be upsetting to all of us. So if you're gonna get upset, I think it's best to try to contain your emotion without being sterile about it, but to understand that if we get really upset, our kids will be upset because their parent is getting upset. And the kids, ha the kids have less knowledge than we do for putting events in context. So remember that some of the things that you believed as a child and imagined how your children might be reacting. I always think of fairy tales. It's always scarier than real life. You know, there are always monsters. There are people putting kids into ovens and kidnapping them and bears and wolves. So remember that facts will calm your kids down versus letting their thoughts uh, and their imagination get away from them. Thank you, Harold. And, and I know I know we're going to come back to pick up on a, a seed that you planted there about our own emotions as parents and and caregivers. And and I really appreciate that you're not setting the expectation that we are supposed to be unaffected by this. If our if our top, even if the top priority in our lives is taking care of our kids, um, when events like this happen, it's absolutely unavoidable that we have our own emotional reactions and sometimes quite profound emotional reactions and making sense of those as parents is so important. So we'll come back to that again. Um, Miri, I, I wonder if I could ask you to pick up on the another piece of what Harold started to talk about. How should how can parents and caregivers, we oftentimes have educators on these webinars as well, think about matching their conversations with children or adolescents to that specific child or adolescent's emotional makeup, their strengths, their vulnerabilities. How do you how do you sort of make that connection as a, as a as a parent? Sure, thank you. So first of all, one of the things we want to remember is that children at all age will look at us for our cues and for making sense of the of the situation itself. Um, so whatever we're showing, they're going to fit in, just like Harold was saying. And research shows that if we can create a secure base where they can talk to us, it's the best the best medicine for resiliency for building this resiliency. So the first thing for adolescents, I would talk about facts in an age appropriate way, kind of similar to what everybody said in before me, limiting social media, limiting the exposure from the news. There is this thing where we want to go online and we want to get all this information, especially teenagers, they have that need to know. And we know that it's not helpful. It's almost like this um, obsession like we see with OCD, that is this reassurance that actually doesn't give us any real reassurance. And in fact, we are left with those images afterwards. So limiting the social media. So I would might start conversation with a teenager with what do you know and what have you been exposed to? And gather information from them, remembering that what they know and what they're feeling might not match what I'm feeling and what I'm knowing and be able to validate that. I've been working recently with uh, the Israeli community here. And one of the things I've been hearing is that generational gap between parents and their teenagers, especially the Israeli parents and American teenagers, where it creates this turmoil within the family and parents feel like, no, you need to take my side. You need to understand that this is hurting me personally. And their kids might say, well, I have a different opinion. I did not grow up in Israel. or I don't have the same experience as you. So being able to have those type of conversation, I think will be really important. Um, very similar to Harold, I would say, give age appropriate information, find out what do they know and give them the facts while constantly reassuring their safety. Whether or not they're part of that region or, or if they're here right now, in my opinion, there is fear everywhere. I think that um, there is a rise of Islamophobia and a rise of anti-Semitism and just a general sense of we're not safe in this world. I heard conversation from people about What's going to happen if, you're, if there's going to be war in the U.S.? What's going to happen if there is going to be third world war? I mean, those are really tough conversations to have. And I think keep reassuring them that right here, right now, we're safe. And if you're not feeling safe, can we come up with a plan what to do to help you feel safe? On top of that, especially with teenagers, I think helping their surrounding environment. So they're spending most of the day with peers or at school, giving them the language to protect themselves. 
Um, some of the teenagers I've met with in the last week were saying that they were getting uh, very hostile messages from their friends. Um, some of them were saying that they don't feel safe at school. They don't feel safe within their community. Some of their friends are telling them they don't share their values and they don't want to be their friends anymore. That's hard, especially as a teenager, to navigate all of that when you're trying to figure out your group and your sense of community and your sense of belonging. So helping them find a language to advocate for themselves, advocate with their friends, but also advocate if they don't want to become the one who's fighting the war on social media. Um, a few teenagers I met with were saying, well, you know, they're telling me that um, my country is horrible and people are bad and we cause everything. I want to answer. I don't know what to do. What if I'll answer and then they're going to argue with me on social media, giving them the power to say no if they don't want to or help them have a more comfortable conversation. And I think it's also a great opportunity to just talk about humanity, no matter where you're from, talking about the other person and being able to respect different beliefs as long as we keep each other safe, I think is really important. It's a lot to take in there. Thanks, mm -hmm. Mary. And, and what you're saying re resonates with so many conversations I've been having with young people and parents too um, about um, the immense amount of information, including really, really emotionally loaded information, sometimes hateful information, sometimes just really complex and nuanced information. And expecting teenagers to make sense of that while they're on TikTok um, is, um, I think, is too much to ask of them. Um, Sharon, I wonder, it, it's, a, it's always on so much on people's minds these days, just any thoughts you have just picking up on the thread around social media and around the media that both kids and parents are taking in any wisdom or guidance that you've been sharing with people in your life? Sure. I mean, first, I want to acknowledge that it's common and natural for people to sometimes feel almost glued to the media during tragedies, including war, you know, and the job of the media in many respects is to keep their viewers engaged and informed. And they do so oftentimes with images and headlines that are grabbing and often quite horrifying. Uh, and we stay engaged because the media is engaging in that sense. And also we want to be informed. We want to stay connected. And for those with deep ties to the region, we may even have guilt if we turn away or limit media. But what we know from a mental health perspective, from a well-being perspective, is that we'll ultimately be more healthy and responsive to the needs of ourselves and our children, our communities, if we limit media intake. And I know that is easier said than done. So there's a few things to keep in mind. You know, when we're talking about our young people, and Harold mentioned this, Mary mentioned this, you want to first check in by asking what your children actually know about the situation and what they're being exposed to. So most children and teens will have heard things from media outlets, including social media from their teachers and their peers. You may be surprised by how much they already know, but in contrast, you may be surprised by what they don't know. You may think that they know some things that they don't know. So it's important just to open the conversation with open-ended questions. You know, as a parent of three teens myself, I think I'm surprised sometimes at how quickly my teens are exposed to information on social media. And often, unfortunately, it's the most horrific or disturbing images that get to them quickly. And I'm also surprised sometimes by the things that they don't know, sometimes because developing Developmentally, not surprisingly, they're aware of many things in their immediate environment, whether it's the math test they're going to take later today or things that are going on in their own social circle. So, again, it's important as adults that we ask open-ended questions about what they understand, what they've seen or heard, and do so without judgment. We have a lot of our own feelings about this, but if we're looking to support our children in this context, we want to just ask them open-ended, what do they know? We know that media coverage of war and combat and its aftermath is upsetting to children of all ages, and it really can increase their fear and anxiety. And we also know that the more time children and adults spend viewing any coverage of the war, whether it's on social media, on television, on the internet, the more likely we are to have negative reactions. And we know that when we actually look at children who are exposed to images and social media around war events, excessive viewing actually makes it more difficult for them to recover afterwards. And as Harold mentioned earlier, very young children may not understand that the events are not happening in their community. And really, to the extent possible, they shouldn't be exposed at all to any of this media coverage. So the younger the child, the less exposed really they should have and you know think about preschool children really should not be watching coverage at all 
well. So if you have things on in the background, uh, it really may not be in the background to the children. Right. You may think they're not hearing or seeing, but oftentimes they are. And then with respect to older children, you know, they're going to have exposure to media. And so as adults, we can watch with them in order to answer some questions or explain things that they might be seeing and even continue an open discussion after you kind of turn the media off for the day, for the evening and check in with them about what's being discussed amongst their peers. As Mary said, there's a lot of very heated and hateful discussions that are happening right now with our teens and social media. And so checking in with them seeing what they're willing to talk about and just letting them know that you're there for them when and if they do want to talk to you about this. But we know that our children and adolescents are going to be turning to adults just to make sense of what they're seeing on media right now. I think it's really important to remember how much time we spend uh, watching either our iPhones or the actual television. And that, you know, tw the real difference today than, for instance, after 9-11 is the 24-7 kind of cable news and the fact that also social media keeps repeating youtube it goes again and again and again and it's very addictive and you have to control it you have to say to yourself i'm only going to do it for x amount of time and the other piece i would just add to this uh, you know very comprehensive explanation is what you say to your spouse or on the phone to your friend about how upset you are or how enraged you are based on what the president of your, you know, of your, uh, as alumni of your university or what a neighbor said, your kids have big ears. So this is a time to protect them. So, you know, high emotion, high conflict is always bad for our kids if they don't have a context to understand why it's happening. Thank you, Harold, for jumping in and, and, and sharing. That was a, a, a lot of great context information as well. And I, and I want, I want to pick up Miri and ask you about parents and about some some basic tactics or strategies for managing our own intense feelings and emotions before, during, and after conversations with our kids or at home of, about things that are happening. Or, you know, the cliche of putting the oxygen mask on you cannot be more suitable here, right? And I know that I'm struggling with that as an Israeli, as someone who has family over there, that constant balance between taking care of myself and taking care of others while caring for my kids. It's, it's hard to balance sometimes. Um, you know, when I think about trauma, I think about emotions and the idea that the combination between that deep sadness that we're feeling right now. Um, you, Sharon, you mentioned grief, and I do think there is some complicated grief here, traumatic grief, and the sadness tells us as a signal that something is lost. When you combine that with that feeling of helplessness and out of control, most people can sit with that, right? So I think the best antidote for that feeling of out of control is agency, is doing stuff. And that might be something very small. It can be today I'm deciding I'm going to cook dinner, or today I'm going to decide that I'm going to go and take a yoga class, or I'm going to get my kids to school on time, whatever it is, but doing it mindfully and telling yourself, I made this decision. I'm in control right now. Now it's not gonna make the situation better all of a sudden, but it's gonna prevent it from escalating. The more cumulative experience that we have in which we feel in control, if they're positive, it's even better. The long run will be more resilient. And that can be something as just doing a quick breathing exercise or taking a long shower or talking with a friend or trying to go and so this weekend for example I took my son to a show that we planned a while ago and for a second I was like am I going to cancel it because I'm not going to be able to actually enjoy the show but I made a decision I'm going to take him and in a very mindful way reminding that to myself that yes I might feel guilty and I'm going to try to enjoy that time and finding this dialectic finding this balance is so important I think you mentioned before um, that sitting with that guilt it's so hard. It's, 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 you know, our fight flight freezes on constantly. And often we would go to that guilt or avoidance or, or anger. So being able to bring it back to sitting with a sadness in a control way, I think it's just so important. That was beautiful. And, th and, and thank you for sharing your personal experience as well. And I, I think the four of us have the the advantage of having something that we can do. We can come together tonight and have a conversation like this to try to be helpful to people. It's a way of feeling like there's some way to be responsive. And I think all of us probably have personal reflections here too. I know that for, for I, my, my kids are teenagers like, like Sharon's. And um, 
And I, my feeling was that they could handle seeing some of the, the intense emotion that I was feeling that they could handle seeing a parent in tears and, um, and that that was an opportunity to talk about the intensity, the overwhelmingness of, of what's happening. And also to show our kids that you can feel something really intense and overwhelming and recover and put it back together and explain what it feels like to feel that, to feel that intensely concerned or, or, or grieving, as you said, Mary. Um, and, and, and that's something that I wouldn't have done when my kids were younger, when my kids were three and five. At, at 13 and 15, it's different. And I think all of us are doing those calculations all the time with the children with whom we're spending time. So, yeah, you, oh, please. Sorry, to your point about that, even I'm thinking about my younger kids. So I have an eight-year-old and I have a four-year-old. And they've seen me cry. I mean, I was trying to hide it the first day and I was like, oh, not going to happen. But being able to have that conversation in their level, I thought made a lot of sense. So for example, with my young one, I said, you know, they, they have anxiety. It's like, you know, just like with sometimes when you're anxious, you tend to go to anger very quickly or you tend to be kind of like more upset. I might be upset in the next few days. That's not about you. That's about me. I'm having very intense emotions. I'm worried about our, 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 our my grandparents. And, and I just want you to know that I might not be on my best. I just want you to know that it's not you. And I think being able to model that as well is really important. And, and notice what their, their behavior. So to Sharon, to your point about social media and just being on the phone before, I was on it all the time, knowing that this is absolutely not the right thing to do, but who am I to take my own advice? <laughs> and at some point, my, my daughter came over and started putting stickers on my cell phone. I was like, okay. They're noticing and it's way too much. They notice everything that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's beautiful. And I, I mean, we're, we're talking about this, this acute situation tonight, but I think what you were just describing, Mary, is, is something that's helpful being a parent every day. There, there, there are days that we come home from work and we're not our best. Um, we're stressed or we're short or we're irritable. And the ability to, to stop, acknowledge that, name it, take responsibility for it, try to do better and do that with our kids at whatever age they are, um, is really helpful for them in labeling their own feelings and in, and in understanding that, that no feeling has to totally take over. Um, I love the fact you took, you're just talking about modeling, right? We don't always have to, I always think that your kids think that everything is easy in your life. You know, you're a success, you're good at sports or you and mom are in love. And sometimes it's good to share it's been a terrible day at work. It's something I was really working on didn't happen. I'm really upset. I, I'm going to go take a run or I, I'm, I need some time alone, which mm -hmm. is a great way because they have bumps in their road all the time. That's right. So, so, so Harold, I'm, I'm going to stick with you and ask you um, just to remind parents, what are some signs that they might see in their kids that are suggestive of real, that the kids are really struggling? They so, could really be experiencing anxiety or grief. It's so I, I think a good rule of thumb, no matter what, is to know your kid. Now, what does that actually mean? You know, what's their appetite like? What what are they passionate about? Do they love sports? Do they love a particular show? Do, do you know what dessert is their favorite dessert? <clears throat> and the way I think about this is that if there's a disturbance in appetite, in school participation, in attendance, in socializing, uh, in sleep again, early, late, or also a removal of things that they are passionate about and enjoying, and now they stop, those are all red flags. And so if a social kid uh, all of a sudden withdraws, pay attention in the same way that you would if you were worried that your kid stopped eating you know, and, and just lost their appetite. You should be concerned about the those sources of joy, of sleep. Um, I, I like to think of it is how much effort do we put in in our own patients, in our own clients. You know, you lean in. If a client tells you that, you know, they're interested in something, a good salesperson, a good business person knows what they're interested in. I think your kids deserve that same kind of attention as baseline. And so for younger kids uh, who might not use words to express their feelings, you should be on the lookout for uncharacteristic behaviors, more irritability, more social withdrawal, more quietness, if that's usually a rambunctious kid, more tantrums, um, 
And therefore, if they start complaining about physical symptoms, stomach aches, headaches, um, you know, nausea, and they want to avoid activities, and by in, by and large, they're not anxious by nature, those are all warning signs that something is going on. And if we know that at baseline, and, and our kids are all different, you know, I, I have three sons who amazingly look so much alike that people will sometimes mix them up when they were in, they all went to the same college and it happened all the time where someone said, oh, they look so alike. And I'm thinking they don't look so alike. I can tell them apart very easily, but they couldn't be more different in their temperaments. You know, one was always slow to warm up uh, and can't kind of aloof. One was hail fellow, you know, well, well met. And, and one could have been the mayor of the, of the college or the president of the college you have to know these differences, right? And you have to also keep in touch with your kid's teacher to see if anything is important that's happening. You know, do they notice a kid who's more withdrawn, less excited about being in school? Um, so it, it all comes down to knowing your kid and seeing changes in behavior, changes in their uh, engagement, changes in their appetite that make you uh, be more aware that something in their world has changed. And certainly, Right now, I think that the heaviness of this, uh, the unexpected nature, the fact that they know that children have been kidnapped, uh, that children were killed, makes it all the more worrisome for them. You re remember, they're so egocentric, but if it could happen to another child, it could happen to me. And that's why I think we have to, you know, gently but consistently reassure them that they're safe. Thank you, Harold. I, th I think that the, the 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 know your child and 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 what's right for that child is right for that child, and a different approach is different for the next kid is is such an important reminder. Um, Sharon, this is obviously we we we've all now talked about our own experiences as parents too. This something about the situation I think really draws on that, even for those of us who've been doing this clinically for a long time. Uh, talk to me about being a being a parent at home and about routines at home. And the role for maintaining routines in a in a time of that's very tumultuous like this one. Yeah, you know, so I love that Mary brought up the example of going to the show with her child because we know that one of the first things to go during times of stress are kind of those um, activities that promote enjoyment, right? Or those daily rituals that we used to engage in, but now we kind of restrict ourselves either from pleasurable activities or ju just from kind of routines and rituals. Those often fall to the wayside. And sometimes it's that urge to kind of hunker down and pull everyone close that keeps us from doing the daily rituals, right? We might keep our kids home from school. We might, uh, you know, have our kids all sleep in one place instead of having them engage in their regular bedtime rituals rituals. Again, that's normal in some sense, right? It's that desire to kind of have safety and security. On the other hand, what we know is that for children and for teens and even for adults, it's actually really important in the face of trauma and adversity to get back to doing routines and those daily rituals tools and to engage in pleasurable activities. So we always encourage families, even in the face of adversity and trauma, to keep routines and schedules as consistent as possible and as typical as possible. So that means things like bedtime routines, uh, you know, bedtimes, uh, meal times and meal routines, keeping those consistent. Even if they've kind of fallen to the wayside for a week, it's okay to then return to what was, you know, kind of more like baseline functioning for your family with respect to rituals and routines. You know, families, as I mentioned earlier, may be worried about safety. They may be worried about some of the usual places that they go in their community, places of worship. Uh, but you can have those conversations as a family and find ways to enjoy your community and enjoy your family together through other activities if needed. So not heighten um, you know, the burdens of feeling unsafe, but still offering kind of activities that promote laughter, that promote joy in your family. Those are really critical right now. Uh, and we, we know, you know, the data is really clear, actually, that having young children and children kind of engage in those typical rituals is important for their healing and just important for them to feel safe, which we're all talking about. It's really critical for our young kids to feel safe right now because there is this feeling of uncertainty and, and concerns about safety. Rituals promote safety. Thank you, Sharon. And and I want to talk a little bit more about practices too. This and this will be, I think, the last question I'll pose to you all before turning to there are some really outstanding and poignant questions in the 
from our attendees that I want to get to as well. But but Miri, can you just share a, a few thoughts about specifically about mindfulness and relaxation techniques and how they may be particularly useful in, in the current context, both for our kids and for ourselves? Sure. Um, so in general, it goes back to the idea of putting the oxygen mask on us first. Um, I think we first need to practice our mindfulness and relaxation in order to be there for the kids or do it with them. I think when you think of mindfulness, it's the idea of actively shifting your attention to be to be on something else, to figure out what do I want to be focusing on. And thoughts are going to come because that's what our mind does, right? They're going to be those images, they're going to be thoughts, but being able to block it and instead of focusing on the suffering and the thoughts, focusing on something else. Now, breathing, mindfulness breathing is something that a lot of people go to, but what I've been noticing in the last week and people might disagree with me, when I tried to do mindfulness breathing with some of the, my clients in this week, they weren't able to breathe. It was too hard for them. It's almost like the amygdala was too activated at that specific point to just do the breathing. So what I suggest is doing more participation mindfulness. So it might be breathing with counting or it might be um, taking a mindful walk, which is great to do, by the way, with your family, right? So you figure out which sense you want to focus on. It can be sight or smell, whatever it is. And you go for a 10 minute mindful walk and then you share your observation. Um, another great one where that really kind of blocks thoughts in a way is the five senses mindfulness. So counting five things that you see, four things that you can touch, uh, three things that you can hear, two that you can smell and one that you can taste and really describing. And the more distressed the person is, the more I would ask them to describe it. Um, there's something very grounding about it. Um, relaxation in general, I mean, when I think trauma, I also think about the body. The body does keep the score, right? I know for myself, I my, my body is so tight right now. I, I could use a massage. And until I get to a point of self-care, just doing some relaxation, right? So the progressive muscle relaxation is really helpful in tightening the muscles and then releasing them. Um, noticing when you when you have more tension. Um, there are a lot of apps out there just to help you kind of like doing some guided meditation or mindfulness. Um, if it's hard to do the observation mindfulness, trying to find something that works for you. Um, and one that I did with my kids the other day was listening to music together. And each one of us chose a different instrument or the lyrics of the song to focus on. And then we shifted. So we put a song that all of us like, it was Queen, and then one of us focused just on the lyrics and that one just focused on the uh, drums and we just switched around it. So it can actually be a fun thing to do as a family. And again, it's all about the modeling. The more I do it, the more they're gonna do it. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. I, se separately, I'd like you to share with me how you get your kids to agree on the same song to listen to, but we can talk about <laughs> that. Yeah. It's all yeah. about point. When you find something that just talks to everybody and it's not just Disney or Baby Shark. Forget about picking a movie, just a song. Um, no, th thank you for sharing that. And, and I think I think having your kids come down in the morning for breakfast and one of the parents is sitting and doing a meditation without having announced it or um, ma made a big show of it and kids see that it's what we're doing in order to cope is, is extraordinarily powerful. So again, I think starting by trying these things ourselves is such a powerful uh, example to set for, set for our kids. So, so I, I want to come to questions and, and I'll, Harold, Sharon, Maria, I'll ask you to just please jump in if you feel so moved in response to some of the questions. Um, there's actually, there are actually three questions that all pick up on the same theme and it's a tough one, but I'm going to go right to it, which is that several of us have said that it's important for us to reassure our kids that they're safe, but they may not be. And that's both kids, kids that, that may feel as though that the, they may be potentially be exposed to terrorism that takes place in the States if they live in the States, kids who have family or may be traveling to, to Israel or, or to Gaza or to the region, um, and then different kind of safety, but safety online, um, safety in terms of exposure to vitriol and hate and really damaging, hurtful things. So is it, is it insincere for us to say, to tell our kids that they're safe when in fact, none of us really have our minds around what feels totally safe right now. How, how do you all think about that? We probably each have ways of thinking about that, but, but please, what are your thoughts? 
So I'll quickly just say that, you know, this is a question we confront a lot when we're doing school-based work about with youth who've been exposed to trauma and are living in, you know, neighborhoods where there is kind of chronic violence and, um, you know, community stressors. Uh, how can we suggest that they think about being safe when they're exposed to this in an ongoing way? And certainly that's amplified in this context of war. Um, you know, the, the reality is we really do need to help our children distinguish between kind of this pervasive sense of fear, right, and, and lack of safety with areas or pockets or people that they can feel safe with, but not sugarcoat it, right? We always say we're not trying to just put rose-colored glasses on our, on our children, on our students by saying that don't worry about it, it's going to be safe, or having them kind of just adjust their thinking to, to pretend that they're going to be safe in every environment. The reality is they're not. At the same time, there are people, hopefully there are some places that they can feel safe. And most importantly, the message we convey is there are people who are trying very hard to keep you safe in the environments they're in. Uh, and you can point to the teachers, you can point to the parents, you can point to their faith leaders and say, we are trying to keep you safe. And there are some places where it may not be as safe. So again, you're not trying to make blanket statements about safety, but you're trying to help them distinguish and find people, places, pockets of safety. Thanks, Sharon. Mary Harold, anything you'd like to add? So I, I actually think it's, Again, it all depends on the age of the child. <clears throat> but if we're talking about the safety of not being attacked by a terrorist, um, I like to play the odds. And I would say you're very safe. If you know we're very lucky, we live in the United States. The president has made a very bold statement and he said he's not only going to help the people of Israel, um, but he's also keeping us safe. And when bad things happen like this, we're more on alert. So our police are more on alert, our National Guard, all the people that keep us safe, the Army, the defense, they're, they're much more aware right now than ever. And the other important part is I'm here to keep you safe. So if you're worried about something, please talk to me about it. It's, it's okay to feel scared, but and it's okay to be nervous. Those are, those are normal feelings. But I want to reassure you that we're doing everything possible so that you're safe when you go to school, your school is safe. And, and I don't think that's false. I think that statistically, that's accurate. And, uh, and I'm, again, the oldest person on the screen. So I could tell you that after 9-11, um, we kept talking about turning the TV off, protecting kids from the images, and, and reassuring them that this very unusual event was not going to happen again. And I remember that, you know, I was on the Today Show talking to Katie Couric at the time. She was the host and telling her that's what we should say. And she literally said to me on the show, she said, well, how do you know that? <laughs> I said, well, we know that because the president, the governor, they're all taking this. And after the segment was over, I said, you got to be kidding. Chicken Little. I mean, we can tell them the sky is falling. I think it's good to reassure people that we're doing new things that will keep us safe. And she said, you know what, I, I, this feels like my husband had just died again. Her husband had died about a year before. My kids are in my bed. I'm on TV four, five, six hours. I'm exposed to this. I'm not sure how safe we are. And I think that when we feel unsafe, when we're overwhelmed, when, and I would tell you that the kids whose parents just got divorced or there was a death in their family, or they have some trauma that just occurred to them, they're certainly more at risk to feeling scared when something awful happens. But I think, again, it's our job to to reassure them realistically why why what happened uh, in Gaza and happened outside of Gaza uh, won't happen to them. And I, I don't think that's rose colored glasses. I think that it's actually good reassurance because statistically that's not going to happen. Now, we can't assure them that it's 100 percent. But if they don't have OCD and they're not asking us, they want to, to tell us um, that their parents are there to keep them safe in, in the most realistic way. Thanks. So, you know, I appreciate that, Harold and, and Sharon. And, and I, I want to pick up on another question from another attendee and, and make sure that we're all making ourselves as clear as possible, I think, because the question here is that it's, it's to some, it may sound that we're promoting the avoidance of addressing feelings. 
Why not examine the feelings, acknowledge worries, reflect feelings, deflecting suggests that they should not have feelings of despair. And so I think I'm, I'm really, I'm grateful for that question because it gives us a chance to, to, to restate, I think, what, what some of the things we're trying to communicate, which is, I think, in fact, is that um, it's, it, it's quite, quite expected and quite healthy to feel really powerful negative feelings when something so scary like this happens, to feel scared, to feel angry, to feel anxious, uh, to feel overwhelmed, um, to cry, um, to have trouble falling asleep, um, to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. And I think that we, we would all say whether our child is four or 14 or 24, that we, we would encourage our kids, as well as our patients, to examine how they're feeling, to express how they're feeling, that our, our, our first, second and third reactions to how they're feeling are to validate how they're feeling, to say that that's a that's a real feeling. And I could understand how you could feel that. Um, and, and especially I'm, to, I would say also to listen to them. You know, my, um, I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old grandchild and my son and daughter-in-law have this thing that they do at nighttime where they ask the, they ask the five-year-old, what is the high of your day? What was the low of your day? And now he has the middle of his day. And clearly some of the lows are really upsetting. Um, and that's okay to, to listen, to respond to the low and simultaneously look for a high of the day. Do you mean? Um, and in their case, they are really sheltering their kids from images and from social media right now. But if they were seven or eight, I think it would be much more challenging as to what they would be hearing at school. And it might be a low of their day to say, I heard that, you know, children were killed or I heard the kids were kidnapped. Um, but I think that's, again, creating a safe space before something terrible happens, that our kids know that they can talk to us about anything they want. We will listen to them and we will provide them with information. Um, and it's also to validate that it's upsetting. It's upsetting to me. I feel like crying about this and I feel worried about it, but I'm reassured because of and, and give sure. them the reasons that they re they you feel reassured. Sure. Thank you. M Mira, did you want to add something? No, I was just about to agree. I think it's absolutely important to have a plan with them while validating their emotions and modeling. So being able to say, I'm scared too sometimes. And here's what I do to calm down. Let's think about something together that will help you as well. And making it obviously age appropriate. I would not have the same conversation with an eight-year-old as one that I will have with a teenager. Being able to identify safety per day might feel a bit more flexible than safety forever. Um, so what can you do today to feel safe? Well, what will help you to calm down today? Is there someone at school you can speak with if you're feeling unsafe at school? When you're home, can we check in? So making it a little bit more concrete might be more helpful. I know for me it is because I'm scared, honestly. Um, you know, I'm trying to reassure myself and I take it a day by day. So maybe making that more of a plan each day and checking in about it, not necessarily every day, but once in a while, open the door to have those conversations. Thank you. And, and Mir, I, I would also make sure we're not asking our kids, do you feel scared? I would make it more, how are you feeling today? Again, mm -hmm. let's keep it open-ended. Let's not sell our agenda, um, mm -hmm. especially if we're feeling very anxious, because then you have the opportunity to say, you know, let's take that mindful walk that you suggested before, which is just a great idea. I love the also the five senses. I mean, these are like golden nuggets that we should hold on to as parents. They really are. They really are. And I, I'm, I'm, already, I'm, I'm already feeling a sense of uh, concern that we're not going to get to so many of these terrific questions. So for those of you that posed questions, thank you for your your courage in posing these questions. And, and, I, and I apologize, we can't get to all of them. I'm going to try to, to combine several of them. Um, so, and, and maybe I'll start with you, Sharon. There, there are a number of questions from educators who are here about how schools can support constructive conversations at school about what's going on, about how schools can recognize kids who may be struggling, um, about how schools can uh, point kids towards useful, constructive sources of information and mm -hmm. away from less useful, more destructive sources of information. Any thoughts about any of those topics? Yeah, and it, it's a overcome. it's a challenging time. We've been working with lots of school leaders, school counselors, frontline teachers who are trying to navigate these while also, you know, uh, 
delivering quality instruction. And this is really kind of front and center for a lot of them. I will try to share in the answer box some of the links to some of the resources that we've been sharing directly with school leaders about educational materials that are age appropriate for understanding what's happening in the region. It is such a complicated issue uh, in many respects with so many feelings on and many different um, issues that it can feel very um, frightening for educators and school leaders to even walk into the content area. On the other hand, part of their role is educating their students about world issues. And so there are resources that educators can go to. I will share a couple of the direct links in the chat to those. You know, one of the things that we encourage whenever there are situations that involve multiple sides um, and kind of very tumultuous times is really teaching about diversity and compassion and empathy um, and really uh, at the same time, it is okay to condemn acts of inhumanity, um, you know, for educators to be able to do that, whether you're a school leader, a district leader, to condemn acts against children and families is acceptable to do. And you can do that without necessarily conveying political messages, which I know a lot of school leaders are understandably concerned about. Well, just... Wouldn't you also say, I'm sorry, Mir. That's okay, go ahead, Harold. Uh, what I was going to suggest also is I, action always is helpful. And so mm -hmm. if I was a school teacher now, if there's some way to get my kids to do something that make them feel better. So, you know, let's let's all go and figure out a way that we're going to send we're going to send money to the International Red Cross because we're worried about kids everywhere. We're worried about the kids who were harmed in Israel. We worry about the kids who've uh, been harmed in Gaza. Um, let's, you know, let's send letters to uh, to people in Gaza and in Israel. Action is really good for kids uh, in the same way of, I, you feel hopeless, you feel incompetent, you feel worried. Uh, how can I help someone who is in worse shape than I am? Yes, it, it, not just helpful for kids, it's helpful for all of us. It's, it's crucial for all of us. Mira, you, you, were, you had a, a thought as well. Oh, just about the school piece. I think, you know, when I think about kids these days at school, needing to deal with the fear and then we expect them to sit through class and really focus on problem solving and math and reading. For some of them, their prefrontal cortex is not working right now. They're constantly triggered, they're constantly thinking, they're hyper vigilant. And I think for teachers to be able to show compassion to that is so important. And maybe having structure break during the day, or if you're seeing one of, the, um, one of your students struggling, reaching out to them and coming up with a plan or telling them, hey, go for a walk or talk to the guidance counselor. They might be afraid to actually ask for help and they might need us adults to help them find the help as well. So I think just also figure out the expectation these days specifically, and that can help also with the shame they might be feeling that they're not doing the way they're supposed to be doing, especially in school environment. Yeah, that's, I think that's so important. Thank you for that. I, I wanna pick up on some of the, there, there are, there are a number of questions that ask specific clinical questions. I just I want to briefly address OCD. There are a number of questions about children of OCD, and we can't do it justice in the few minutes that we have, but I'll just say that one of the reasons that a, a few of our panelists mentioned, except in OCD or it's trickier in OCD, is that children and adolescents of OCD may be particularly difficult to reassure, and in fact, reassurance can sometimes be counterproductive for OCD symptoms. And so we'd really just encourage you, if you have a child or work with a child who has OCD, to talk to their mental health professional, their psychologist or psychiatrist or counselor about specific techniques to work with them, with a child with OCD in the context of trauma or of acute anxiety to figure out strategies that are specifically helpful for that child that don't unintentionally reinforce their OCD symptoms. It's a really important thing to pick up with your clinician. Uh, there are also a number of um, individual young people who are mentioned in the chat who have had direct exposure to the trauma um, in Israel um, or who may have an underlying mental health condition that maybe have been exacerbated in the last few weeks and just how important it is to take those 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 symptoms and those difficulties really seriously and have a low threshold please to talk to somebody as a parent talk to your pediatrician talk to a teacher a guidance counselor at school um, reach out to a mental health professional and just know that while 
a worsening of symptoms in this context is not un unexpected, it's really important not to leave it unaddressed. And we'd really encourage you to, to, to get extra support right now. It can only be helpful. I, I wanna pick up on, 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 on one additional question, and this may be our last one, maybe we can fit in a, a second, but I think this is such an important question, not just about Israel and Gaza, but also just about living on earth in 2023. Um, uh, Isabel says, as a school counselor, I've been hearing a lot of teens conveying the idea that nothing matters because of the violence and conflicting opinions and hateful messages they're seeing. How do you recommend that we respond to teens feeling of hopelessness about the future? And I think this sense of nihilism or hopelessness, whether it's about Israel and Gaza, or whether it's about climate change, um, whether it's about uh, political polarization, all of these factors that young people, particularly teenagers, are really paying attention to. How does each of you think about talking to the teenagers that are in your lives about how to balance out some of these more hopeless or difficult feelings? Any thoughts? That's a one. <laughs> it is, yeah. I think to me, I would go back to the idea of what's under our control and what are some very specific calls for action. So it's hard to think about, hey, let's change the world, but what is one thing you can do that's under your control to make some sort of an impact and do it completely heartfully and mindfully. So really lean into that and holding on to that hope that, okay, maybe I didn't change the world, but I changed one person. And fun fact, I just learned it today. There is something about Judaism and Islam, and I'm not a religious person, so I'm, I'm being educated every day, that both Islam and in Judaism, there is something about if you save one soul, it's as you save the whole world. And I think it's so amazing that we all share this concept. We all share this value. So leaning into your values and being able to make a difference, even if it's a small difference, that's a change. And that's huge. I think you really have to, I think let's lean into that, right? So I, I'm being very serious that a teenager who's worried about climate change, and I know that angst about climate keeps coming up in our offices all the time. It's hopeless. No one's doing anything about it. You know, there's not going to be an earth for me. It's the moment of saying, what can you do? You know, how can you make a change? You're not going to change the whole world, but if you can do something that will not only make you feel better, it might encourage someone else to do it. And the same thing when people start talking to me, college students, that it's not worth voting. It, it's certainly worth voting. Every election seems to be so close now. Your vote really counts. If you really believe in a candidate, then you should support that candidate. You should try to encourage other people to support that candidate. It will make a difference. And sometimes you'll lose and sometimes you'll win, but you can make a difference. I think, again, that small small steps, you know, small conversations, opening, that's the way to think of it. You can't take on, you know, telling them to change the world can de depress all of us. So, or demoralize us, not depress, demoralize us. So yeah, Sharon, I, I, I wanted to hear what Sharon, I I jumped in before Sharon had a chance. I not apologize. at all. I, similar to both, to what both of you are saying. I mean, one, I think as we've said all along, we have to validate the feelings and say, sometimes we feel that way too. Sometimes it can feel hopeless given how large some of this feels. It brings up so many large feelings for us. But also, even though sometimes it feels like our young people are not listening to us as adults, we do need to model that hope for them and say, even though I feel sometimes hope here's what does give me hope, whatever that is for you, and to authentically share with your kids what it is that gives you hope. What do you feel? What do you do to give you hope on a daily basis? And what in the world actually makes you feel hopeful? And you know, your young people are listening. I, I think I think all, all four of us went to the same thoughts and the same themes. But at, at I was at a at a, a religious congregation in the last two weeks, and a, a youth leader who's a, a brilliant teacher and reacher of young people uh, in the middle of, of, of a lot of sharing of grief about what's happening, came up to address the congregation and acknowledged we're all feeling something really powerful. It's, it's, we're feeling there, there's a lot of grief and there's a lot of sadness in this room. And then she had a long pause. And then she said, tomorrow at 2 p.m. we're coming together to make sandwiches for homeless in our community. Um, this is something that, and she made eye contact with kids sitting around the room that you can do and you can do and you can do and you can do that will contribute a little bit of healing of the world. 
And she didn't have, the connection was so clear and it was very beautiful and it was very touching because um, it, it is all that we can do, but it's not nothing. And, and the more that we can share that um, and, and find ways to act, to act on that, the better. And I think we can all draw on each other's hope as much as possible. So Sharon, Mary, Harold, thank you for this conversation. To our attendees, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for all that all of you are doing for the kids in your lives. And I hope that we can continue to pull together. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Matt.